22, uh, ah, cat, uh, 22 inch and everything. I mean, it's going to be great having it up there because, you know, well, right now, uh, you know, the, the pr long projections are is that the uh, park is going to remain closed and Griffith Observatory remain right. closed. And actually, I really brought this, uh, this idea up a couple of years ago because uh, we had been through a, a, a summer where we just had lots of thin clouds ruining everything on uh, the public star party nights. And somebody uh, had offered us uh, an 18-inch Newtonian, and um, and you know, there was a lot of discussion about uh, how much easier it would be to set up a slightly smaller scope, although still big, uh, than the 26-inch. The 26-inch is kind of kind of a lot of work, and even though it's such a you know, it, it people people want to look through it because they see it; it's gig, uh, ginormous. Uh, but it it's rather underutilized up there because you know we're we're limited to looking at the moon, and maybe we'll look at Jupiter or Saturn, and that's about it. That's right. So you know, the plans are still still in there. I operate that thing all the time, but just because it's in the city, you're not going to see anything yeah. more than you're going to see in a five inch. Yeah, exactly. Light pollution. You get more definition, but you're not going to see any more. Right. Up a lock with that thing would be amazing. Oh, yeah. I'm, I really look forward to it. You know, I mean, uh, what I did manage to see through the, uh, the 31 inch before the horrendous accident, um, you know, it, it, was, it was great. It was yeah. really nice. Hey guys, hey, hey, um, hey, this is Spencer. Yes. Let me interrupt for one second. So oh, I've yeah. started, I've started live streaming this to YouTube now. So it's oh, on okay. YouTube. So hey, just, right. just be warned. Thanks, so hi, Joe. Hi. Yeah, the twenty six isn't that hard to hey, set up. And if we put it up to Lockwood, it won't need yeah. to be assembled to be put away. Right. So it'll be just a matter, pretty much, of rolling it out. And uh, yeah, you know, roll a path, tell red lineup or whatever, right? And be operational. It's, um, I think I mean, we need to, right don't you think we should work, working on it? Yeah, but the tracking was working, it could be easily fixed. And even that, there's no real setup. You, you just have to point it <clears throat> at the north celestial pole, turn it on. Mm -hmm. yeah. After that, you can push it and drag it anywhere you want, and it'll track by itself. Cool. There's Does no it setup. Even if you move to another object, if somebody bumps it, it doesn't matter. You just put it wherever, and the thing will track. Good. Yeah, really nice. It would be hard to move by accident. Um, no, no, it's, it's not that tight. Yeah. It's not that you put the clutches. Yeah. People move I think you're talking about the twenty. I think we're probably about about a twenty-six inch. Um, the twenty-six. Yep. I'm. I'm a. So completely ignorant in 90% of the astro stuff. Um, it's a inch inches, is that a, a refractor or a reflector, oh. a Dobsonian? You could call it a Dobsonian, but it's not exactly on that base, but it's a 26 inch diameter reflector. So it's a Newtonian. It's a new uh it's a Newtonian. Okay, so the view, the, the IP slash viewfinder, whatever is on the side. At the top, and it, you have to have a big ladder to get up to it. Yeah. Oh, the top. Oh, oh, but it's on the side. Yes. So it looks into yeah. a mirror that looks down and then back yeah. up. Yeah, it's it's an alt uh, alt uh, alt azimuth uh, uh, mount. So you could put a camera on the side of it. Oh yeah. Uh, sure. Maybe right. one of the well, lots of things we can do with it. That's, probably, that's not going to work. No, because uh, you have a background screen, Joe. Hold it, I think, in front of your face, uh, oh. Joe. <laughs> there you go. No, yeah, there we go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh okay. Oh. So that's what those big darn aircraft loading ladders are for, to the climb one. up to be able to see Right. In. Yeah. Okay. Like I said, I only know my little system and my little world of 
astrophotography. I don't, I'm learning all of your stuff. Uh, Kevin? Yes. Kevin? That's Dave. How are you doing? Oh, hi, Dave. Hi. Good to, see you. Good to see all you guys. Hi, Rob. Hi, everybody. Hi, Jerry. Hey, Dave. How are you? All of you. It's really great. Uh, I, I bought uh, six 25-inch uh, stakes with, um, and I bought a roll of glow tape. So we're going uh -huh. to experiment with it on Saturday. Sure. How, uh, we'll just put out the stakes at, we, at like particular points and see if it's going to work for the cars. And I'm okay. also going to put some glow tape at the edge of the ramp for you. So I think with that should look oh, yeah. pretty well. Yes. Well, hey Dave, I've That'd got some great. red. I've got some red LED okay. strip lights that I'm planning on putting at the edge of the ramp. Uh, just jumping in, I'm one bringing the sledges for David's stakes, right? Uh, I got you can, but I have I have a hammer. I'll see if it works. Hopefully, it's I'll bring the big sledges just in case we need bigger. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and uh, you're gonna uh, I you want to try the glow tape instead of the red because uh, uh, it might be too because uh, the glow tape's not that bright. I mean, you know. And, uh, the, I have a dimmer on the LEDs. I mean, we can do both because I've got yeah. two 15-foot, two 16-foot segments of LED strips. And so the ramp is 20 feet, 20 feet so if you could put the glow tape right at the very edge on the platform. Spencer, can't we just center the 15 feet of LED <laughs> in the middle of the 20 feet of run? And Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I plan on doing that. But uh, the, the the ramp is – there's a – on. At the end of the ramp, there's probably about a platform that's probably about what four feet by four feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so right, that's so a flat you, platform, and so that could be a trip hazard because it's yeah. it's kind of level with the ground. So that's, that's where the exactly yeah. No, I I like yeah. the I like I like the idea of doubling up on something, yeah. especially if like if the power goes out. Right. Mm -hmm. That's exactly where I was going to put the glow yeah. tape at the very mm -hmm. edge there. Okay. That's a tripping okay. hazard. Yes. Yeah. Spencer, uh, yeah. quickie, uh, you mentioned an issue that I hadn't thought about before when we we're doing all that. What if we like put some dirt around and above so that you step, you walk down into the platform instead of it being a step up that you would trip onto? Uh, I wondered about that, but I think because of the slope and with erosion, it, I don't think it would stay very long. Uh, okay. But I mean, we can try it, and you know that could it be. Might, it of... might be worth doing yeah. just right. one winter and see what happens. Yeah. Hi, Annie. I don't see your picture, but I see that you're on. Hi. Can someone describe the uh, drive mechanisms on the both axes of the 26 inch? 26. I think it's called a side tech controller. It has, en it has encoders on the motors and encoders on the. The axis where it moves, so it knows exactly where it's at, no matter where you put it. Uh, does the software support a, a go-to function, so it's very easy to use? Hey, Thomas. It is uh, really easy. I think you might have a, an audio issue. Yeah. Uh, might want to move your microphone slightly closer or change your gain. You're breaking up really badly when you speak. Hi, Annie. You're, you're muted. Uh, thank you. The mic is closer. How do you hear? Uh, no, it got worse. Got worse. You're too. The mic's too good. Yeah. Hi, oh, David. No, Hi, everyone. I'm sorry. No, God. Hi, Annie. Hi. Hi. Yeah, yeah, I got your new toy behind me, Annie. I'm sorry. I got your new telescope behind me. Bye. How? What? How? <laughs> That's a picture. That's a picture. It's yeah, just a picture of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> Tim has arrived. Tim, what is your background? Behind you, the no, item <laughs> on your screen. It looks like the mountains. It is. It's it, it's Mount yeah. Wilson. Does it look familiar? Have you seen it before? That was before the that's fire. Mount Wilson. Oh, so, okay, so that's a that's an aerial of Mount Wilson. Ah, that's it. That's yeah. Okay. I swear he looks like uh, he looks like God with that that beard uh, uh, in that setting behind him. Not God, Gandalf. <laughs> Gandalf. <laughs> totally Gandalf. This just just needs the hat. I can tell. <laughs> I can tell how old people are. Because the old fogies like me say I look like ZZ Top, 
<laughs> and the guess. people in the middle I look like Gandalf, and of course the young ones I look like Dumbledore. So I got them all covered. Uh, by okay. the way, by the way, I am totally the ZZ uh, generation, but you fit all three of them. You just need more on the top. <laughs> And my beard is older than the ZZ Top beards because I had my beard like four years before they did. So they had it before they were born. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, we're one minute away from the official launch. I see Curtis on there. Yeah, I'm on here. Yeah, I'm here. Oh, I'm waiting for something on TV to get oh, Carol boy. taping on something on TV. <laughs> As soon as it comes up, I'll turn the tape on and we'll get the meeting going. <laughs> so just uh, just uh, as a reminder, this is being streamed to YouTube as as well. And it's being recorded there. So if you don't want your picture showing up, then you kill your video. Hey, Mal, you're famous. I was looking around to see who turned off their video and nobody did. <laughs> No, I'm just keeping it off. Hey, Dom, Gregory, <laughs> Jose, how you doing? See, Kevin Cheek, he just yep. puts his cat in front of the camera and <laughs> ignores everything else. <laughs> Thank you, it's not famous. Kevin, is that uh, cat of official member of the club? <laughs> official? No, sorry. <laughs> you don't have a family membership, huh? Uh, <laughs> well, it didn't include that didn't include him. <laughs> he, he he only attends the meetings now that we're on Zoom. He, he doesn't go anywhere else. Hey, Jose, it's good to see you. I know you're muted, but it's nice to say you're saying hi. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> All right, cat, time to move. Okay, how many do we have on uh, Spencer? We have thirty people, That's and. Not just uh, if everybody checks their chat, there mm -hmm. you'll see two links. Uh, we'll talk about them later. But uh, but if you definitely want to get in on the drawing for the prize, go ahead and click the link for the drawing and uh, fill in your name and email address that we can contact you at. So okay, Curtis. I don't yours. see anything on my it. chat. Oh, it. okay. Hang no, on. there's let nothing me, there. All right, let me refresh nothing it there. there. All right, hang on. All right, you see the two links now? There we go. You got it. Yeah. Okay, Curtis, it's all yours. Oh, okay. So, uh, how's uh, this is the uh, the uh, November general meeting for LA Astronomical Society. We have to do this via Zoom again this time around. So, hopefully we'll be able to get uh, back into the uh, into uh, Griffith Park uh, before the next millennium comes around. But uh, anyway, we have to use our meeting for, we have to <laughs> zo use Zoom for this meeting. So I wanna make sure that you guys are, uh, Spencer, we do have, uh, we do have uh, uh, more members than we normally have. Do we have any new members on the Zoom tonight? I thought I saw do we have, Chris. Do we have any new members? Christy V. Yeah, and, we are. And, uh, yeah, okay, two. Okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Where Don here. here. We have Chris and Paul and Don. The, hmm. the, Paul, the Paul window has two people in it, so that might be two new members. I'm not sure. That's right. Two new members. I'm here. Paul. Two new members. All right. Welcome to the club, guys. <laughs> okay. So I think think our membership is uh, we're actually considering we have a Zoom have to do everything via Zoom and we're not doing anything as far as the club's concerned except for some isolated activities out at Lockwood Valley and some activities at Ford Observatory. But in general, we're kind of, uh, we're kind of uh, shut down. 
So at least we're getting, uh, at least we got some new members joining the club and we're not doing too bad. Actually, we're doing fairly well on the, uh, on the uh, club membership. Now we want to also make sure that you do um, uh, fill out your entry for door prizes on uh, via the, the, uh, the chat room. There's supposed to be a link that should appear somewhere on your screen for the entry for the, uh, for the uh, uh, door prizes. We're actually able to do door prizes, which is pretty good. Okay, now the other thing is, uh, the next thing on the agenda is uh, I think all the only real committee report that I think we need right now is Lockwood Valley. And Kevin, you go ahead and tell us what's going on in Lockwood Valley. Um, okay, yes. Well, uh, this Saturday, November 14th, we're gonna have, well, as uh, you're probably expecting, it's dark sky night because it's full moon, uh, new moon, sorry. Uh, but uh, we've also decided to have a work party day. It's probably going to be the last one possible uh, before uh, the weather turns kind of bad. So uh, John O'Brien had uh, made a long list. Is John O'Brien online? Um, no, I yeah, don't. I I'll don't think him. so. So, well, anyway, let me just direct you to uh, uh, John had uh, made a very detailed list of of. Uh, things that uh, we are currently working on or would like to work on and um, uh, all the kinds of needs of, of uh, maybe tools or, or uh, equipment. Um, so I direct you to, uh, it was on the uh, groups IO general discussion page. So anyway, uh, the weather, well, it's a, it, it's a little early to projecting out to uh, Saturday, um, uh, it looks like possibly by about 10 p.m. on Saturday that there's going to be a little bit of, of thin clouds, but after midnight, it, it's kind of looking bad. So if you're a star member, uh, please note that you can come up, um, well, you can come up anytime, but Friday evening looks like it's going to be uh, uh, very clear. So take a look uh, at either cleardarkskies.com uh, cleardarksky.com or the astrophoric uh, astrophoric.com uh, which is both available as a website and also as an app for smartphones. I, I know I have it on my iPhone. I, I, I assume that uh, uh, other versions um, are that will work as well. Or if you go uh, so, to the uh, if you go to the LAS website las.org, uh, there's a link where there's a quick link at the bottom that gives you those uh, resources Kevin mentioned and the weather service and some others all in one shot, one one page, and also gives you the current weather conditions at Lockwood. Okay, thanks, Spence. I think that's pretty much it. Kevin Curtis. Oh, okay, guys. Uh, the other, uh, some, okay, the other thing I will mention with the other. Uh, uh, committee. Uh, it's myself and Joe Phipps are primarily the uh, one for the Ford committee. We are planning uh, a, a, an outing at Ford this weekend. We're, we're going to try to get the telescope open this weekend, but we may have difficulty. Uh, could get some cloudy weather. In fact, last uh, Saturday night, it was snowing up there. We got a dusting of snow and it is getting down into the 20s and 30s at night. So it could be a very difficult very mm -hmm. difficult uh, star party to have uh, uh, a star party at Ford this weekend. I'm not sure what we're going to do just yet. We will make an announcement if uh, if uh, we're going to have something. Uh, Joe, do you kind of agree with me on that? Well, definitely. It's getting down in the 20s. Yes. I don't think, yeah. I don't think we'll start making snow at the skiing areas yet, but uh, I got to think it's suspicion they may be starting pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, we lose the, we lose the observatory for the season. Yeah, they do night skiing up there and with the lights they turn on. You can mm. forget about using the observatory. That's what okay. I was about to ask. Do you know if the lights are on yet? Yeah. Not yet, but we don't know. They could be now because last weekend we got snow up there, the first snow of the season. And uh, 
fact, I can probably go on after on the computer after we get done here, and we can look at the uh, webcams and see if the uh, if the lights are on yet. They got webcams at Mountain mm -hmm. High. We can take a look at that and see what they look like. But it may be, it may be uh, the lights may be on already. Okay, thank you, Joe. Okay, the next thing, the, this will be the last call for nominations. Uh, Spencer, go ahead and take it over to the last call for the nominations, and then I'll let you go ahead and introduce our speaker. Okay, okay. Uh, Spencer? All right, so yeah, the today is the last day for nominations, so I have to receive the nominations before midnight tonight. Uh, there's a, in the chat, I put in the, the link for the <laughs> nominations. Or if you want, you can, if you want to nominate somebody and don't want to fill out the form, just go ahead and type the name, nomination, and the position in the, on the, in the chat, and I'll, I'll record that. Uh, basically, we've got, uh, I think all the current officers have been nominated and have accepted. So myself for secretary, Joe for, uh, I mean, um, Curtis for president, Alicia for vice president, and uh, John for uh, treasurer. We have board members. Uh, I think the current board members have been nominated, and we have two new nominees for board as well. Uh, I'm sorry, I take that back. Not all the current board members have been nominated, but uh, we have eight nominees for bo the board, which is what we need, uh, the minimum that we need. So if you want to nominate anybody else or any office or the board, you know, like I said, fill out the form or type it in the chat. Um, the people who have been nominated uh, need to give me a short bio so I can include that in the ballot. So the ballots will be mailed out via email uh, on November 30th. And you have until December 13th to send in the, your ballot to, to vote. So it's an online form they just fill out. So we'll cut off the voting at uh, around midnight on the 13th. Uh, well, actually, 12.50, 11.59 p.m. on the 13th. And then that'll be, uh, the general meeting will be Monday, December 14th, and we'll announce the results there. And um, that's it for nominations. But uh, that reminds me, Curtis, we forgot to talk about the format for the November, for the December meeting. Did you want to quickly talk about that? Uh, the no, the uh, for the uh, uh, what, what were you uh, mentioning, uh, Spencer, for the for the December meeting? Yeah, December meeting. Historically, when we were meeting in person in Griffith, we would actually give people the option of voting in person, and so then we would tally all the ballots up. And while we we're tallying up the ballots, it was uh, generally a uh, show and tell, so people could show off their uh, their favorite pictures or talk about things. And so we, uh, so we had a sign-up sheet for people to uh, to do that. Do we have anybody signed up to do anything on that yet, well, or should we, we put an announcement out to do that? Yeah, we'll put an announcement out. We haven't really asked anybody to do that, but we'll put an announcement out. Okay. Yeah, for for those uh, astronomers that have actually been doing some some astronomy during the summer here, uh, if you've got some astrophotography, astrophotography photos you want to um, uh, share with us or something that uh, we have, we also have uh, uh, little talks if we want to do little talks. So there's things we can do for the uh, for the uh, December meeting. That's typically what we do, and we've also got another thing uh, that we usually have in January: the banquet. Uh, Unfortunately, the banquet, we will not be having a banquet uh, in January, so we will be doing a, uh, a virtual banquet uh, via Zoom uh, for the banquet for in January. <clears throat> so I think that's what the plan is right now to do the, the, um, the banquet via Zoom in January. We may have it the same night as the general meeting. We're not sure yet. I don't think have we decided? I don't think we've decided that, Spencer, have we? No, no, we haven't. Okay, so that's that's still up, up in the air, but we'll have the banquet. It'll be kind of a quasi-banquet sometime in January. Normally, we take uh, the January meeting. We don't have the January meeting, and we had the banquet. But uh, this time around, it's everything is all goofed up. Uh, but anyway, I do have an update for Mountain High. Uh, they do have the lights on a mountain high. They are making snow up there right now. So uh, we may not have a Ford this weekend. Okay, Spencer, why don't you go ahead and introduce our uh, guest speaker if uh, there's no other items that we need to cover right now. Well, actually, I'm going to defer to Tim because he's, okay. I, he knows Josie much better than I do. Oh, okay, good. Uh, Tim, you have it. I have at it. <laughs> oh, boy. Well. <laughs> 
Our, our speaker this evening is a high school senior whose name looks suspiciously like Einstein. Um, <laughs> Good one. Despite the fact that she's a high school senior, uh, Harvard Westlake, um, she's already a seasoned data cruncher. She's worked on a balloon board submillimeter astronomy project uh, that flew in Antarctica. I don't know whether she actually went to Antarctica where the thing flew, uh, um, but I think she did go to South Africa where she was working on the South African Large Telescope, copy the hobby Everly on white dwarf spectra. And now she's, uh, I guess, uh, at Caltech. I was working with Tom Prince, who was at Caltech and, and JPL, on uh, a peculiar, strange binary star thing. A binary star is like a zoo. There's 10 million different kinds of binary stars. There's this one particular weird kind. And so she's crunching data on that. So by the time she actually goes to college and starts studying astrophysics for really just hand her diploma and say, you're, you're done now. <laughs> just got it all finished <laughs> and so anyway she really knows what she's talking about i hope she knows what she's talking about because she's going to talk about it right now <laughs> go <laughs> you have your microphone off unmute there. yourself Josie, and and spencer let her share okay screen. i'm gonna i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna let me drop my screen share you can go ahead and sh share yours okay um uh, let's see hang on hang on let's see where we go one second here. Yeah, no worries. Well, I mean, while you're setting that up, I can share a little bit about myself. So um, I'm actually a member of this group, but most of you have probably never seen me in your life. That's because I live in Santa Monica and I'm a high schooler. So it is very difficult to get all the way out to Pasadena on a Monday night <laughs> for meetings. So, um, and then as soon as we went virtual, I was super excited thinking I was going to be able to make the Zoom meetings now. And then my weekly college counselor meeting got moved to the exact same time as our normal meetings. So um, I am a member, believe me or not. Um, I am not able to show up as much as I would like to, but I am always keeping up with the newsletter and everything. Um, so yeah, that's maybe why some of you may not have met me before. Um, but my name is Josie, I'm 18. Um, I'm a high school senior right now, and um, thank you so much for the introduction, Tim. Um, yeah, so like what he was saying, I have I did my first internship um, when I was 16. I worked at University of Pennsylvania, um, and I worked on, uh, like he said, um, a balloon-borne project, and I did not get to go to Antarctica. It was very sad. Um, I was a high school intern, so I was not invited to that part of the, <laughs> of the process six months later. Um, but it was still an amazing opportunity. And, and then this past summer, um, I was supposed to, or sorry, not this past summer, the 2019 summer. So not this one, but the one before, um, I was supposed to intern at JPL. And then at that time I was 17, not 18. So someone from the HR department kind of stepped in and said, you know, you're not, you're still a minor, this isn't gonna work out. So then I, I still wanted to have an internship. So I figured out if these American regulations are gonna stop me, guess I gotta go abroad. So I ended up going abroad and I went to South Africa, which was amazing. I got to work at the University of Cape Town. And um, if I, some of you may have heard of the telescope SALT, which is, it's the largest one in the Southern hemisphere. And, um, so I spend most of my time working at the university, which is about four hours away from the telescope. But then one weekend, I took the four hour drive up there and got to do some overnight observing, which was just incredible. And then um, flash forward to this year, um, I did kind of a virtual internship this summer, starting in June. And I'm finishing about, about right now, um, working for Caltech for the Keck Institute for Space Studies. And um, so this was my first real I guess like personal research project because the other two internships I did, I was, um, you know, spending a lot of my time working on projects of of um, my superiors or learning from them. And this is my first time that I got to do my own research. So um, I actually two days ago just sent out my research note. So um, hopefully they like it and it comes back and they'll publish it 
which would be amazing. Um, yeah, so I'll, I guess I can share my screen now. Yes, um, go ahead. Okay. Okay, so this is my, oh, let me just make sure I can see this all fine. Okay, perfect. So this summer I researched a, um, a subsect of binary star systems, which are called HW Virginis systems. And um, they're more commonly known as HW Ver. So I'm gonna refer to them as HW Ver throughout the presentation, but they are more formally known as HW Virginis systems because the first one that was ever discovered was inside of the Virginis constellation. So um, that's how it got the name. And um, yeah, so this is about my HW Ver research. Okay, so first of all, just starting super broad, what is a binary star system? So many of you, you know, you're all part of the, the you know, the Astronomical Association. So most of you are probably very familiar with this, but if any, if any of you are not familiar, a binary star system is two stars that orbit around each other or more specifically around their common center of mass. And one of the issues that astronomers come across within um, their observations is that these objects are so far away from us that they oftentimes look like one star. So if you're just looking up at the sky and see a little dot of light, you could be looking at a binary system, but it just looks like one star. So scientists have to use more complex methods to determine there's actually two stars there and not just one. And um, this is a famous kind of pop culture reference, the scene from Star Wars, where you see two, like a two sun sunset basically. And that is probably the most commonly referenced um, mm. and commonly known version of a binary star system that most people would, um, would maybe have seen um, at some point. So what is an HW ver? An HW ver is just a type of binary star system. So like Tim was saying before, there are so many types of binary. So a binary just means there are two stars. And depending on what types of stars make up that binary, that'll determine what type of system it is. So an HW ver is just a, a, a like a subsect, basically a type of binary. So the star, can you guys see my mouse moving by the way? Yeah. 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 Okay, perfect. So. The star over here on the right is a hot subdwarf, and the star over here is an M dwarf. And so I'll go into more depth explaining what each of those mean in a second. But um, as you can probably guess by the name, hot subdwarf is the hot star in this system. It's much hotter than the M dwarf. And another kind of common misconception that some people have is that a star that's more on the red side of the spectrum is hotter, but that's actually not true. I think a lot of people in their heads associate red with fire and fire is hot, but actually the bluer a star is, um, the hotter it is. And that's because of um, its electromagnetic properties. So what is an M dwarf? An M dwarf is the most common type of star in the universe. So it's way more common than the type of star that our sun is. So you can literally get these, you see them all over the place. So something that I'll explain in a second when I talk about hot subdwarfs um, is that hot subdwarfs cannot exist on their own. So an M dwarf can exist alone and these, you, they occur all over the place. So these stars are not very massive. So the way that stars um, uh, just exist, I guess, and function is they, um, they burn through their elements and it starts, you know, going, sending you back to high school chemistry for a second, they start at the first element on the periodic table, which is hydrogen. And then number two is helium. And the most massive stars can fuse down to the seventh, which is iron, the seventh element on the periodic table. Um, but these stars don't have enough mass to even get to helium. So they spend a super, super long time just fuse, fusing hydrogen and they do so very slowly. So that means they're a very stable star. And just to give you a little perspective, these stars last up to 10 trillion years versus 10 billion years, which is the lifespan of our sun. And obviously those are both still very long periods of time, but comparatively 10 trillion years is a lot longer than the lifespan of our sun. So recap, super common, find these everywhere, just your average, average Joe basic star. 
So the next thing is a hot subdwarf. So a hot subdwarf is a very rare type of star and it can't exist alone, unlike the M dwarfs that you see all over the place. So why is that? Something must occur called common envelope. So when a star goes red giant, which means it's fused up a lot of its um, elements, it's maybe getting to a later stage in its lifespan, the atmosphere will slowly begin to expand. And this happens at a very slow and steady rate. It expands and it's expanding, you know, 360 because it's a sphere. So it expands out in every direction. So it's like, like when you're pumping up a ball and you see the ball getting bigger and bigger, it's, it, that's what it's like. So um, when that happens, the atmosphere expands very, very slowly, very steadily. And eventually it gets to a place where it's expanded so much that there's so much room between each particle in the expanding atmosphere that it's pretty much just dissipated at that point. It's not, it's no longer like a cohesive, you can see it, it's just all the, everything's dissipated. So that happens over a very, very long time. And while that's happening, the core is finishing its, its um, fusion and a white dwarf star is left and that cools over millions of years. So what would happen if a companion star got in the way when they're, you know, the, the atmosphere is expanding and it's uninterrupted, right? So the gas is just going, going, going and nothing happens and eventually it just goes away. But if a companion star is in the way, that's when common envelope occurs. So common envelope, basically here's how it works. So helium fusion, sorry, helium fusion starts in the core of the hot subdwarf and the star, like I explained before, the atmosphere starts to expand and keep in mind, these are binary. So the M dwarf, they're, they're circling each other, right? So this star, the hot sub dwarf, the atmosphere is expanding and the other star is oh. orbiting the whole time. So the atmosphere is expanding. This other star is kind of mixing it up, swirling around this expanding atmosphere. And so the atmosphere gets kind of, it's like stirring the pot, right? So then the atmosphere, instead of super, super slow, steady expansion, it's like whirled around and then it just is expelled super early. So what ends up happening is rather than that slow and steady expansion, giving the core enough time to finish its fusion and leaving a white dwarf, the atmosphere is like shot off too early. And what's left behind is a, like the exposed hot core, basically. So the core is not done fusing its helium. So um, it didn't, basically it's like, it wasn't ready to be ex exposed yet and it got exposed too early because of the common envelope process, which kind of caused this premature um, exposure of the core. And so um, when there's fusion happening within the core, there, you know, there's energy inside the core. So it pushes out on the radius, the energy that's um, from that fusion. So a hot subdwarf, the, the leftover core is like 10 times bigger than that of a white dwarf, which no longer has that energy pushing out. So the, the circumference um, shrinks versus, um, so basically what we're left with in this case is a larger, about 10 times larger in terms of radius and much hotter, still actively fusing core versus the white dwarf core that would have been left behind without this other star getting in the way and messing up the atmosphere expansion. So that is a hot subdwarf. So hot subdwarfs stay hot for hundreds of millions of years because they still had more work to do to get to that, that later state. So this is uh, this image down here um, kind of shows what's happening where this star here is expanding and this star is you can kind of see it's creating almost like it almost looks kind of like a whirlpool or something swirling it up and just getting in there getting in the way and messing it up so super quick review before we move on what is an hw ver it is a post common envelope binary which means it's a binary system which has already undergone common envelope um and it consists of a hot sub dwarf and an m and an m dwarf and the hot sub dwarf is much hotter than the m dwarf and why, why are these special? So they're special because it has a very rare type of star. So hot subdwarfs aren't common. Remember, like I said, they can only exist when this um, common envelope effect has occurred. So that means they're not, you know, they're, they're not very common. You can't find them at, at, you know, every place in the universe. 
So the other reason that they're special is that they have very, very short orbital periods. So the systems that I was working with, which I'll talk more about my data in a second, the systems that I found had periods, the average period was about 0.17 days, which is just a few hours. And if you think about the Earth's orbital period around the sun being 365 days versus a few hours, that kind of gives you an idea of how close together these things are. And um, just, I don't know, I mean, I, I'm a total nerd about all this stuff, but I just, I find that comparison super crazy about um, just how close they are because it takes in just a couple hours to, to um, orbit versus a full year, so. So how do we find them? So recall earlier that I mentioned far away binaries blend together and they just look like one point of light. So here's, here's how it works. So ground-based telescopes, they will look at that point of light and measure how much light is coming from it over a few seconds, minutes, or hours, depending on how long um, your exposure time is during that observation. And also the other important thing to recall is that and I, I know I've been pushing this, but it's super important that the hot subdwarf is way hotter and brighter than the M dwarf and they're orbiting each other. So going from that, you can, um, you can understand that there are two eclipses, right? So if there's two stars, there's gonna be one eclipse where the hot subdwarf is in front and one where the M dwarf is in front. So when the hot subdwarf is in front, the M dwarf must be behind, right? And so the M dwarf is not that hot, not that bright. So only a little bit of light is blocked because it's the dimmer star that's partially or fully covered. Then fast forward the other eclipse, now the M dwarf is in front, the hot subdwarf is the one that's blocked in the back. So now a lot of light is blocked because it's the brighter star that's in the back. So there, therefore, it makes sense that this is what a light curve looks like for an HW ver. So when the hot subdwarf is blocked, a lot more light is blocked, so the brightness dips all the way down. And then when the M dwarf is blocked, you see kind of a little baby eclipse over here. So when there is a dip in the graph, that is an eclipse. And you can see here that there is, there's a pattern to it. Big dip, little dip, big dip, little dip. And here's another example of this one. The secondary eclipse is a little more obvious. Um, so this is the general shape that I was looking for in my analysis of the data. So the, teles the, the, the site that I was using data from is called ZTF. It's the Zwicky Transient Facility. So that's at Palomar Observatory, so not too far from home. And um, the data that I was using was in the form of these graphs, which are called light curves. And so basically these are measuring the brightness over time. So when you're looking at these, um, these graphs, you can see that if they match this pattern of having a big dip and then a, followed by a smaller dip and then continue that cyclical pattern, then you can know that it's an HW ver because there's the double eclipse happening and one star is significantly hotter than the other. So that's one of the ways that astronomers get around that issue of when you're looking at it, you can only see one point of light because the brightness of that one point will vary over time if something is going in front of it. And so similar, um, similar methods are also used for finding exoplanets, um, that's called transiting. So if a planet is going across the surface of a star, the light during that, that crossing um, is gonna dip a little bit. So kind of a similar idea. So this is me at Palomar. Um, this was from summer 2019, I actually got to go visit. So this was a year before I actually started this internship, but I just happened to be um, visiting. So this is my, my selfie at the 48-inch um, telescope at Palomar. So this is not the actual telescope that, um, that took my data, but this is um, one, of, one of the telescopes on the facility. So what is a cataclysmic variable? So now we're moving away from talking about um, uh, HW verse for a second. So a cataclysmic variable, also known as CV, it is a white dwarf, which is accreting matter from an M dwarf. So this is another binary system. So if you look over here, this looks pretty similar to the graphs that we were just looking at a second ago, right? So it, you clearly see this uh, deeper eclipse 
And then in the middle here, it looks like, you know, you can kind of make out that secondary eclipse, but it's all pretty, looks kind of fuzzy, messy, sloppy in between. So I found a lot of CVs in my data because the graphs are so similar. So basically, um, I think this image, um, I think is a pretty good illustration of the white dwarf here and it's accreting matter from, um, from this, um, excuse me, from this M dwarf over here. So when you put these side by side, you can see how, you know, obviously this looks a lot sloppier in the, the central area, but you can see how they could be confused. So actually when I began my research, I miscategorized about 14 of these as HW verse. And so my, um, I, was, I worked with a professor and a graduate student from Caltech, uh, Professor Tom Prince and Kevin Burge, who's the graduate student. So I went to them with all of my, I presented my data to them and they, um, they started telling me about what this means, the CV, cataclysmic variable light curve. And so it turns out that later in the lifespan of an HW ver, it actually becomes a CV, which makes sense because if you remember, we're left with that hot subdwarf, right? But that's not gonna be burning forever. It's gonna eventually do its fusion. And then that energy that was pushing out on the circumference, it's gonna shrink and eventually it's gonna become a white dwarf. So then you have a white dwarf M dwarf binary and, um, and it's a, a still accreting matter. So to me, it makes a lot of sense that these light curves look so similar if this is kind of a later stage of this. And you can understand that um, it starts off like a super neat system. And then eventually over time, it's kind of deteriorating and getting kind of mush, not mushy, but you know what I mean? Like it's, it's kind of becoming its later stage. It's um, like grandpa version of what it used to be. Um, yeah, so this was a super, super cool find within my data. So I found a Nova. So basically, um, if we go back for a second to, so just keep in mind um, this image right here. So basically what's happening is every once in a while, when you have a CV, it's accreting all of this um, hydrogen from the M dwarf. Cause remember M dwarfs are, um, they're fusing hydrogen. So it's uh, accreting all of this hydrogen. And then sometimes, like it's a rare occurrence, but every once in a while, some of that hydrogen will rapidly start falling towards the surface of the white dwarf, like super, super, super fast. So the white dwarf is no longer fusing, but what happens is this hydrogen falls super fast to its surface, and then it begins fusing on the surface of the star. So when that happens, it gets super, super bright. So this is what I'm seeing here. It's something called a nova eruption. So the hydrogen accretes from the M dwarf, falls to the white dwarf surface, and then it fuses on the surface. And it it's almost like um, a, a bright, you know, it's for an, a more extended period of time, but a little bright flash. And for a second, the star is super bright because there's fusion happening again, but it, it's just on the surface. So it's kind of like trick fusion, I guess. Um, and so this is kind of the homeostasis state of the star. And what I caught on here was the end of um, a nova eruption. So up here at this point, um, the fusion was happening. So all that brightness was there and then slowly declined and reached back to its homeostasis once that nova eruption had completed. So while I was looking through all of my data, a lot of my graphs looked something like this or they looked something like I, I call it um, like a barcode, just a bunch of black lines that are nonsense. And because um, most of my data is not going to end up being good data because I visually inspected almost 5,000 of these graphs. Um, and I ended up finding, um, you know, in the, in the range of the 40s of how, how many of these objects I found out of 5,000. So most of the data that I looked at in the graphs was inconclusive. But every once in a while, there's a bit of data that doesn't look like the generic inconclusive data, but looks like something kind of out of the ordinary. So 
what I did is I, I noticed this one and I said, that looks kind of funky. I don't really know what's going on there. So I plugged it into this site called Marshall. So Marshall is a, is a site that Caltech uses where basically you take the um, RA and the, the right ascension and declination, which are coordinates of an object, and you put them into uh, the system. And then any um, records of observations of that object will pop up. You can click on it and then it gives you um, kind of an accumulation of all the data of all those times that that object has been observed. And then you can input the period if it's, um, if it's a binary or something like that. You can input the period and then phase fold it. And basically what phase folding is, is if you imagine your, your old math textbook and you had um, like a trig problem with a sine curve, the sine curve always started perfectly at the, at the axis. And you know, it was never like halfway done. It was always starting perfectly. So phase folding basically does the same thing. It kind of neatly lines up your, um, your cycle with the axis so that it's easier to read and um, easier to see the pattern. So I phase folded it and it looked super weird. It looked like this. And the reason it looked super weird is because it wasn't supposed to have a period because what I was seeing was the one star with its big flashes. I wasn't seeing a binary. So of course it looks weird when you try to give it a period because it does, it's not supposed to have a period. A single star doesn't have a period. A binary has a period because that's how long it takes to orbit. So it ended up looking super weird. And then I did some more research and I found out it was a Nova. And that was a super, super cool find. Um, these aren't very common at all. So even though this was not at all what I intended to look for in my research, it ended up just being kind of a lucky find I stumbled upon. And I'm, I was super excited to get to tell everyone about it. So yeah, so my research findings I discovered 46 HW vers, and I cross-checked my database with um, the database of a paper called the Erebos paper. And so that is the other most significant um, study that has been done on HW vers. And that is a, um, a Southern hemisphere study. And mine was obviously Northern hemisphere since I took it with a Northern hemisphere, California telescope. So most of my objects are in the Northern hemisphere and most of their objects are in the Southern hemisphere. So we only overlapped on a few. So um, very excited to say that I have 26 HW verse systems that were previously unknown before my research. So um, those are now under my name, which is extremely exciting. And then in addition, I discovered 14 CVs the one Nova that I showed and one eclipsing white dwarf M dwarf binary, which is just another type of binary. And then um, this is my actual plot that I used in the, the research note that I just sent out to the board to knock on wood get published in the next few days. Um, and I plotted the HW verse I found in galactic coordinates, which basically is just gonna tell you their like general location. Um, and so the reason that this plot is interesting and I couldn't include this explanation in my paper because I didn't prove it numerically, but a lot of star formation happens in the galactic plane. So something that you can kind of extrapolate from a galactic coordinate plot is that if a lot of these um, systems are centered kind of around the galactic plane. Those ones are probably younger because that's where star formation happens. And ones maybe like this one up here that are these ones way down here that are farther from the galactic plane, that probably means they're older because if they were born over here, it had to take them some time to travel to get where they are now. So it can, it's, I didn't prove this mathematically, but um, uh, astronomers can extrapolate that this will tell us the age of some of these systems and that can help us understand how they're formed, how long it takes them to get to the current state they are and from that state how long it takes them to get to the, the CV state. So that's just something interesting and um, I'm sure once my once my paper gets officialized I'll send I'll send it out to everyone. It's just a page long because it's um, it's not a full paper it's a research note. Um, and it has this plot in it. So you guys all got to 
sneak peek because this is not officially published yet. Um, but yeah, so that is the main gist of my research. So if anyone has any questions, I hope that I hope that was helpful. I tried to make a talk so that no matter what your experience is um, with this type of research that you would be able to take something away. So I hope everybody was able to take something away from it. And yeah, let me know if anyone has any questions. Wow. <laughs> I'm blown away, Josie. Thank you so much. Uh, what is your I'm good talk, was... Josie? Thank you. I, ha I have a really, really, really dumb question to ask. What of does course. HW mean? You know, now I'm feeling like the dumb one because I don't know the answer to that. Oh, I, <laughs> well, I do. I'm not the only one. <laughs> no, that's a stand. That's a standard. Uh, um, uh, cataloging of uh, variable stars in any constellation. I think I went through this on one of my talks. It starts, yeah. it starts with an R, I believe, and then goes through to Z. <laughs> then when you go to A, it's A, 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 B, A, C. I, I mean, oh. it, it just goes nuts. But uh, <laughs> that's basically what it is. Why somebody chose to do that, Lord only knows. But that's what I discovered in one of my uh, papers or talks. It's, it's it's like, you know, what does this mean? Yeah, I, w I was looking up. I guess it's just kind of a nomenclature. Yeah. Um, but it's a catalog then. number, basically. It's a catalog. Yeah. Yeah, but why didn't it, why it doesn't start with A, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, Josie, thank you, Jesse. I, I, I have a question, Josie. This is Dave yeah. Yackerson. Uh, as a, I was a teacher in high school, I'm just curious, uh, at your high school, what did they? What classes taught you this or got you interested yeah. in this? Yeah. Um, okay, so I I didn't learn this stuff from a class I took at school. I um, so. I've actually, <laughs> yeah. Um, I've known that I wanted to to be an astrophysicist since I was probably like I think nine, which I know is not a very common thing to hear come out of a nine year old's mouth, but. Um, I, I took a summer class. There's, okay, so the John, Johns Hopkins University, they have this program um, for elementary, middle and high school kids, mainly for elementary and middle school kids, um, where you can take these summer courses where basically most of the themes of the classes are something that's super interesting that you could probably never find within um, like a school curriculum, you know? So mm. I was able to take this super cool class about physics when I was, you know, it, it wasn't intense calculus based math based physics, it was more conceptual. Um, but when I was, that was when I was in third grade, and then in fourth grade, I took one called flight science. Um, and I just, ever since then, I've just loved it. And I've just every summer taken either some whatever summer class I could find. Um, and then once I started high school, I started doing internships at that point. A couple, a couple of questions after this. Uh, just, just, yeah. uh, where, what grade are you in, and where are you headed? What college do you want to attend? And are you, I, I imagine you're going to end up with a doctorate. I have a really funny <laughs> feeling about that. But where, 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 what's your, what are your hopes and your visions? Where are you going with this? Yeah. Um. So I'm a senior, so I am in the middle of application season. Um. So I, I applied early decision to the University of Pennsylvania. That's my, my number one choice right now. Um, but I have still, I mean, hopefully everything works out with that, but I have still so many schools that I'm excited about. So I applied, um, early action, uh, to University of Virginia, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor and, um, Wisconsin. Wow. So I, I, and I still have, I think seven more schools after that, that I'm going to apply to. So well, if uh, they don't take you, they're, they're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I wish you good luck uh, with your future, uh, Josie. Don't let anybody you stand so in your way. Thank you. I appreciate that. Oh, by the way, um, by the way, this is Dave Nakamoto. Um, yeah, you're not seeing me because you don't need to see me. But, uh, <laughs> no, really. I, I, but, but I'm curious, that last graph you showed, which was the plot yeah. of your stars against the galactic uh, plane, mm -hmm. why is there a gap? between about zero and minus 90. Yeah, okay, so this was confusing me a lot at first and uh -huh. I was trying to figure out, I thought I had messed up 
something in my coding. Um, but I, it like, I think it like wraps around. Oh, so, okay. Like, you know, those, um, those earth maps where they're trying, where they kind of cut open like the back of a globe and flatten mm -hmm. it. It's like, mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Because if you extend, if you think that, uh, as you should, that anything to the left wraps around and comes around to the, to the right, it's, it's still startling that uh, happened there. And I can't figure out what, what might be causing that, because I, I assume zero is the galactic center. Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, you got some stars close to the galactic center on one side. So, you know, it's, it's a head scratcher. Yeah. I think part of it is um, part of it is about where in the sky this survey was looking, because um, I obviously didn't have access to data from, you know, like every every single telescope in the world, which that would have been amazing. But um, so I think it's partially because of where the telescope I used was located. Um, uh -huh. I think that was part of it, and then also part uh -huh. of it. Um, just like parameters of these systems, I guess. Yeah, it, it uh, looks Mr. like Spencer, the data uh, is clone, so that it depends on, I mean, you have to be looking at the night sky. And so if your data covers a limited time period, you're going to get a limited chunk of the sky. Oh, I don't that's think of that too. Mm -hmm. Well, look, there's a lot of things that those of us in Southern California can't shoot because we will never see them. And okay. that makes me look I look at that and that's what I see I see there's a an area from say zero to 90 that is invisible to me that's uh, a hemispherical issue at some level I would think would wouldn't it also have something to do with where we are in the galaxy maybe all those things on the other side of the galactic center are just further away and harder to see could be Josie, yeah. I, this is Spencer. I have a question. Yeah. Do you comment on the, the sources of the data? Is all this data just out there? People have just done surveys and collected uh, time sequences of, uh, of stars to uh, just just to, as part of a survey and, and stored for people to mine? Yeah, okay. So um, partly yes, partly no. So um, uh, I was, I felt super lucky that I was officially a, a Caltech intern or employee. I don't know what exactly to call it, but I was officially working for Caltech over the summer. And I guess I guess I still am. <laughs> um, but because of that and because of the people, like the professor who I was working with and my the graduate student who's my like main research mentor, they have access to all this super cool data that most people don't get because they're um, you know official like Caltech people. So uh, this is something that I actually just learned a couple days ago, but um, so ZTF, which is the, um, the facility that was used to take the data that I used, um, there's three different, um, I don't even know what, what they're called, but three different like databases of, of their data. I know that sounds redundant, but um, so there, there's ZTF1, ZTF2, and ZTF3. So ZTF1 is public data, so anybody can use it. And then ZTF two and three, I think you, you have to be affiliated with either Caltech or some other institution or university that um, interacts with the ZTF people. Um, so for mine, I some of my data is from ZTF one, two, and three, but mm -hmm. um, stuff from ZTF one, I think like anybody can can access it, but two and three, you need to be like affiliated with the, the university. Well, somebody made a concerted effort that said, I'm going to look at the light patterns from HW Virgin stars and just started collecting that over, over time. Yeah, so actually, um, one of the reasons that I got started on this project, um, well, at the, at the beginning of, I guess, end of spring slash beginning of summer was when the pandemic was starting to, you know, <laughs> take hold in America. Yeah. And so... I basically had to figure out a project I could do without live data being taken because um, with the social distancing protocols, all the telescopes were closed because these are um, 
you know, these are facilities where pe- like a person goes in and so Z- ZTF is actually um, um, roboticized, but most of the telescopes, um, the big ones at least, you know, there has to be a person who goes in and is sitting at the computer doing the controls. And so nobody was allowed on these facilities. So my, um, my boss and I, we looked through a number of ideas of projects I could do basically using existing data that data that had been taken, but then was kind of just sitting there and nobody had really done anything with it. Um, so I guess that that probably was useful to them because there was data that they were just sitting on that nobody had used yet. So that was probably helpful to to them to kind of get some of that, get get some some actual science out of that data. Um, so I, I mean, honestly, I don't know if there was a person who decided to take these all at once, or I think they were more just taken over a long period of time because basically the way that we found or the way that we narrowed down which data points I was going to look at is we took all the data that had been taken in ZTF one, two, and three, and then we cross matched it with, um, this, um, I don't know if some of you might be familiar with the Gaia database, which is a database that basically just has a ton of stars, a ton of everything, um, like massive database. So, there was um, somebody made this author. His name is uh, last name is Geyer. He made a um, a survey of hot subdwarfs taken from the Gaia DR2 uh, survey. So we cross matched all of the ZTF data because that's what the telescope that I had access to. We cross matched that data with the Geyer Geyer from Gaia <laughs> hot subdwarf catalog, and then found the common points. And then um, we applied something called the Boxley squares algorithm, which basically um, it's an algorithm that wasn't originally invented for the uses of astronomy. It was, it's an algorithm that when you apply it to data, it looks for like dips in the data. And uh, you guys can probably see how that would be useful in this because I'm looking for patterns in the data that have dips. So we found, we cross matched the data, then applied that. And then the, the ones that were left over and like passed all those tests were then the ones that I analyzed. So I think it was kind of just, that was, that was, sorry, that was a very long-winded answer to your question, but um, uh, a lot of data taken over a long time and then just kind of chopped it up because there was no new data being taken when I started my project. By the way, before you continue, I love your, the photograph uh, to your right and behind oh. you. That shows you really do belong in the LAAS. <laughs> and if nobody else pointed it out then, yay! <laughs> This yeah, is Dave, this is Dave again. Yeah, look, look. my favorite movie on, and my mom's oh. friend. My mom's friend is an interior decorator, so she took my poster and put it in a pretty frame. So now it's like my my fancy art in my room is just my poster from 2011. Yeah. Hey, hey, t- Timothy, the stage- fan of that movie is an astronomer. <laughs> Timothy, this is Dave Yackerson. Uh, does Josie uh, is she in touch with the our our speaker from last last month who was who was with Caltech? Louisa Rabot. Um, yeah. Sorry, I, I don't know, but that's easy to fix. Do you know Louisa Rabal? I I don't she think run, so. She runs the NITARP program for IPAC at Caltech. NITARP is the program that takes high school teachers and teaches them how to analyze astronomy, data, and then they go back and then they bring students with them. Uh, but you already done everything NITARP people do and more. <laughs> probably. Oh, okay. so. uh, but she yeah, was one I mean, of my colleagues at Spitzer Telescope. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, I mean, one of the things that was, I mean, obviously <laughs> a lot of things were devastating about the pandemic, but um, one kind of unfortunate thing is because my internship ended up being through Zoom, I didn't get those hallway interactions. So um with people in the department so in past internships that I've been in you know during your lunch break I could sit and meet a lot of the other professors or or even uh undergrad students who I could relate to on an even greater level um and so because of the zoom configuration of all this I didn't really get to meet anyone in the department aside from people that I was working with directly so um everyone keeps asking me oh do you know this person this person i'm like i'm sorry i don't, I don't really know i'll be over by net by the middle of next year i have I, i'm making a prediction to everybody <laughs> also, i'm just hoping that i get to go to college in person because i have friends who are doing college from home I'm now sure, i'm sure you will i'm sure you'll have that opportunity 
Uh, this, this is Mike Gardner from Berkeley, California. I've got a couple of comments or one question. What is yeah. the, uh, what's the magnitude of this H.W. Burgess? Uh, and secondly, I'm assuming that you've been in touch with the AAVSO. Uh, and are they tracking <laughs> any of these types of stars? I'm a member, but I've never tracked any of this. So I don't, it's, it's kind of new to me. Okay, so actually I was, I was just emailing um, Ms. Ward from AVSO. So I'm not, I'm not a member, but a professor that I, I was talking to a professor um, who suggested that I reach out to them because I know that they have the annual meeting. So I applied to present at that. And then there was a little bit of a snafu where my application to present was never received. And then, um, so um, like the way that they offered me in the end to present, I didn't have time to make a new, uh, they wanted me to, to make um, like an infographic kind of. Mm -hmm. I have, I have a, a lot of calculus and physics homework too. I don't, didn't have time to make an infographic. <laughs> for them. So maybe I'll present next year. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. But, um, yeah. And then um, uh, in terms of magnitude, they're all, somewhere around here like I'd say that their average uh, I mean I, I call it the average level which is just the the period between the two eclipses where the stars are mm. somewhat side by side um, you know anywhere between 17 and 19 yeah usually yeah yeah thank you great yeah. talk right. Josie I have a quick question yeah um, any idea, are, th are there any estimates for how long that type of Nova event, like how the, what the duration of that might be? Is that in a couple of weeks maybe, or longer, shorter? I think it's, I think, I'm pretty sure it's a few weeks. Um, I didn't, oh yeah, so I mean, I guess, oh, let me move the, the bar down here so you guys can see. Uh, yeah, so I'm not sure exactly how long the, um, that heightened period lasted, but in terms of the um, the downfall, it looks like about a year here. Um, yeah, I, I didn't go in depth into a lot of uh, reading about how long those would take. Um, I can probably, I can look that up for you um, and I can probably send that out, yeah. But I, I think it's on a, a scale of weeks or months. Okay. Typical. Yeah, typical. Typical. Thank you. Okay. Josie, yeah, I'm a, hopefully, what's a, a, a quick question. How much variability was there in the orbital period of the HW version you found? Um, oh my gosh, I don't know um, exactly. I can tell you my, my average orbital period was um, one or 2.17. Um, or I might begin there on 2.117, something like that, something about a, a, or sorry, excuse me, 0.2117 days. And um, the long, like the ones on the much, much longer end, um, not, nothing exceeded two days. And um, wow. yeah, so they're all, they're all yeah. pretty short. There, there wasn't anything yeah. crazy like two seconds or <laughs> there couldn't be a two second, but you know what I mean? There wasn't anything like a couple seconds versus a year, it was all within wow. out, like hours, I think maybe 48, 48 hours max, max. I don't, wow. think, I don't think it was, was quite 48 hours. Thank you. Yeah, Hello, Josie, can I have a question? Yeah. Hi, um, first of all, congratulations. Thank you so um, much. Yeah, I'm a, a high school counselor actually, and I was didn't catch the name of the program that you said you'd attended in middle school. I'd love to send oh. some students that way. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm gonna totally recommend it. It's literally the best thing ever. It's through Johns Hopkins. Okay. It's called CTY Center for Talented Youth. Okay. So there's um, what's the name of the? There's some exam um i'm forgetting the name i took it when i was like eight years old um <laughs> and, it sounds like i can look it up though yeah you you take some exam and then if you send it to um 
or it's like your ERB scores, if you qualify with your ERB or ISCE scores, then um, you qualify for the program and then you take this other test and then um, you can sign up for whatever class you want. And actually, I, I didn't mention this, but when I was younger, I don't know if any of, any of you have heard of uh, Winward School, so uh, middle and high school in LA. And so um, the program I did rented out their campus every summer. So I did programs there um, for CTY. And then when I was um, 14, I did one where I went to the actual Johns Hopkins campus. And so I got to wow. stay there and live in a dorm for a few weeks. And they, they rent out a bunch of different college campuses across the nation. But mm -hmm. for the, the younger people, I think you can only do local ones. But then once you get into middle and high school, you can do residential and three go stay in a dorm. So it's an awesome experience. Highly, highly recommend. Okay, wow. thank you very much. Yeah, of course. Okay, are there any other questions for our speaker tonight, for Josie? Yeah, old furry face out here in Colorado. I want to oh, say- Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. You forgot Freezing. to shave, Jack. <laughs> uh, uh, I just want to say congratulations in spades. That is one of the best uh, presentations I've ever heard from somebody in your age group. Thank you so and much. Somebody said a PhD in your future. I think I think that and a Nobel Prize. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we can only well, hope. You know, Einstein and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, For sure. Okay, well, well, thank you for that, Jack. I think our, our guest really, really appreciates that. And yes, uh, it is amazing that we have a high school student doing a project like this. When I was in high school, it was kind of uh, kind of yeah. watching the football games and playing in the band, that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. and, and I couldn't play music worth a hoot. I wanted to uh, <laughs> wanted to make hello. Wanted to make one yeah. more comment. Uh, think seriously about the University of Colorado. In in Boulder. Yes. Yeah, they have. I know they have amazing astronomy there. Yeah, I'm always yeah, I was a young, a young kid, a heck of a lot younger than you were that I met uh, back. Oh God, a hundred years ago, I think it was <laughs> in the park uh, by the name of John Bally, and uh, he made good. Lost track of him. He uh, stopped uh, at my place right after I moved to Denver. And after 25 years, I got a phone call from him. And the short of it is he's a professor now at the U of Colorado. That's amazing. Amazing guy. Uh, uh, get on a Denver Astronomical Society website, denverastro.org, and uh, snarfle around in our YouTube things. He's given a couple of talks. I think you'd be impressed. Okay, yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. The funny story about John is he lives uh, up above Breckenridge in the mountains at uh -huh. 10,700 feet. And when he goes to Mauna Kea, they, they insist that you acclimate at 9,000 feet before you go up. And he howls at him. And says, I live 1,700 feet higher than this, this place. So, yeah, they, they have their fun. Okay, thank you, Jack. One of these times, you're going to have to put some video on so we can see what you look like these days. <laughs> oh, nobody wants to see Jack. I, <laughs> I, like people, I like people to think I'm the worst housekeeper in Colorado, and I don't turn on the video. I don't want to offer proof. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jack, I, image like me. Yeah, Jack, I've known you for, what, 30 years now or something like that? <laughs> something like that. Yeah. I still remember that shootout at the uh yeah i remember that shootout we had yeah that's great okay is there any other questions for our for our for our guest tonight for our speaker well thank you a lot josie for giving that presentation it was fantastic we all enjoyed it, it was a very very good presentation thank and you good so luck much on your future uh colleges and everything you're going to do in your life i know you're going to go far Thank mm -hmm. you. I appreciate that. Appreciate the, the, the talk. And one of these times when you get an opportunity, when you finally get things open, come on over and visit, visit us at Griffith Park. We have our star parties over there. <laughs> I can't wait to come. And I um, 
I guess once I'm in my second semester of senior year and I'm finally allowed to employ my senioritis, I will be there all the time. <laughs> okay, well, we'd love to have you uh, do one of our events and stuff. So I think you'd enjoy it too. It's a lot of fun to get out with just, just get out with people and just enjoy people and look through telescopes and and, and yeah, Jupiter still looks nice. What you're looking at is a little different, but Jupiter still looks nice to a telescope. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, do, I do actually have a quick question for Jesse, for Josie. Um, we all run around with our own telescopes in our yards or at Griffith or whatever. Do you actually do any of that or are you only studying the sky from observatories and stuff? Uh. Okay, so I am very ashamed to admit, I have a telescope I bought when I was, oh my gosh, 14 maybe, um, and no, 13, oh my gosh, and I was so excited, you know, um, got super into it, and just the second high school hit, have not been able to touch it, I've probably touched it, like, two, three times throughout all of high school, just with how crazy busy I've been. Um, I don't even know if it still like connects to my app on my phone anymore. So um, I definitely have to get back out there, relearn the tricks. I think I got so discouraged because I live in a very, very light polluted spot. So I have to triangulate and sometimes I can't even find three stars. And then at that point, is it even worth it? You know, so. <laughs> Yeah. Well, Josie, if you get an opportunity to go to Colorado and see Jack Eastman, you'll see his his telescope made in 18, what was it, 1874, 1877, Jack? Uh, the big one, the six inches, 1877, and the little yeah. pipsqueak I just got here a little while ago is 1870. Okay, the well, there or Josie, you can just come when you come to Griffith when, when they open Griffith Park again, and hopefully, God willing, Mount Wilson. Uh, you can see we have the, uh, we, uh, a couple of us have the newest and the new, di newest uh, digital telescopes. And you can look through those. You don't have to go all through. The <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I can't wait. No, it's a, uh, Dave, you're right on that aspect of it, but it's always fun to look through the eyepiece. Yes, it is. I agree. Okay. Well, uh, okay. I think we get to our next uh, item on the agenda, which uh, will, Alicia Hurst, the vice president, will talk about the updated code of conduct. We need to update that code of conduct in our bylaws. I don't think we have to go through an actual bylaws updating, but we do have to uh, get approval to do the uh, updating of the code of conduct. So Alicia, it's yours. Wait. Okay. I think we already did the approval, but um, I'm still going to go over it here. Yeah, let me yeah go ahead. Yeah. Well, uh, you're on the agenda. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hold on. Trying to share screen here. Uh, there we go. Okay. So I'm going to be talking about how we updated uh, Appendix 2 of the Code of Conduct. Um, if I can get this. There we go. I'm gonna go over the purpose, why I'm doing this presentation and why we changed it. I'm gonna go over the updates and then we're gonna have a Q&A. So what happened is we had a general member, Evan Renteria, who approached us and wanted us to edit it. So we went over it, we edited it, we updated it, we reviewed it and we approved it back in October pending some final updates. And we changed some grammar issues, we clarified some of the guidelines and we also updated it based off of lessons learned. So I'm gonna just run down like a summary of the changes pretty much. So we added further details to explain what kind of abusive, unsafe and illegal behaviors are not allowed. Um, and that's pretty much how it reads out right there in the bullet below it. Uh, for section two, we added the use or possession, use or possession of so we don't allow the use or position of air guns, fireworks, or other hazardous devices or materials. Uh, section three, we added a section that doesn't allow drones without prayer authorization. In section four, we added additional safety protocols and a location where the protocols apply. So we added the section that you cannot run in any telescope setup area and also that 
the places that you can't do anything in that list include the Ford Observatory. Um, we also added this section that children must be supervised by a responsible adult guardian at all times. Uh, in section five, we add an exception allowing alcoholic beverages at LA banquet. And I also wanna clarify that in the original version, it pretty much banned beverages at any LAS event, including water. So that was kind of a problem. So we, yeah, we fixed that. So it's clear it's alcoholic beverages we don't allow. So you can bring water to events people, okay? Uh, section six, we clarified smoking products to include tobacco, cannabis, and vaping, and that illegal drugs and narcotics are prohibited. So if you have normal medicine that you need to take, you can take it. You're not banned from your normal medicine taking. Uh, section seven, uh, there were no changes. It was pretty much the uh, same intent. So I'm gonna stop here before I go to the rest and ask, does anybody have any questions up to this point? Or can I move on? Okay, there's crickets. <laughs> you can move on. Okay. Yeah, I think you can move on. All right. Section eight, there were no changes. It had the same intent. Uh, section nine, we added unless the members give permission. So you can keep your pet away from other members' equipment unless the members give you permission. I don't know when they're going to do that, but they might. So it's there. Uh, section 10, we added a section for Griffith Observatory to follow visitor guidelines and staff directions. So when you're going there for parking, you need to follow the directions that they give you because there's only certain places where you're allowed to park when you visit the Griffith Observatory as an LAS member, especially for our general meetings. Um, and they also have their own website of guidelines that you need to follow. Uh, section 11, we added a section to follow Scott's Lockwood property guidelines as well as the user guide. Um, I think the user guide is finished by now. Um, maybe Kevin can add to that, but right now that's what you're following are the guidelines that are in this general appendix as well as the user guide that it has. Uh, um, Alicia, so, I yeah. just up uploaded those to uh, Andy. Okay. Uh, but I wanted to, to, uh, to make sure that uh, Spencer and I connect about that. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Kevin. Okay. Section 12, we added a section to follow the Ford Observatory guidelines, the training course that's in a development, as well as the user guide. Um, maybe Curtis wants to speak to where those are in their process right now. Well, they're in process right now. I'm working on the, on the, uh, Ford Observatory on the training course right now. The user guide, uh, yeah, there's there's some things. In fact, the tra training course will include the user guide. Of course, the code of conduct with Ford. We must be very very uh, careful up at Ford. It, it has a lot of has many many hazards that we need to be aware of, and uh, uh, we would always always at all times like to have at least two people at Ford at all time, uh, whenever an activity is going on at Ford, we'd like to have at least, we would need to have at least a minimum of two people for safety reasons, because it is, it does have a lot of hazards at the Ford Observatory. So we'll, I'll get that going. Hopefully by the springtime, I can get that training course done because uh, Ford's getting ready to shut down for the, for the winter time anyway. Back to you, Alicia. Cool, thank you. Thank you, Curtis. All right, and section 13, which is the final section, we added this section to follow health and safety regulations. So it reads, if attending an LAS event, please follow health and safety regulations passed down by the government agency that has jurisdiction over the location where the LAS event is being held. Um, so this isn't just COVID-19 related, this is in general. Any health and safety regulations need to be followed during that period of time, especially at an LAS event. So these are the last sections that are in the uh, Code of Conduct, Appendix 2. So does anyone have any questions about this part? Are we good? You're hitting crickets again. I'm hitting crickets, so I'm going to move <laughs> forward. Um, so does, does anyone have any questions at all? I know that it was finally sent out, I think, yesterday to the mass. Um, so I would encourage people uh, to go and read the email that Andy sent out with the Code of Conduct attached. And if you have any questions or if there's something that you think really should be changed, then you can bring it to the next general uh, board meeting that we have. I think it's in December, 
right? It would be December, looks like December uh, 7th. Okay, December 7th. Yeah, a month from now. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I have one one quick uh, observation, if possible. I don't know if this is sure. if we can do this or not. And thank you for doing all this, by the way, Alicia, and all you guys, everybody involved with the board. Um, if I, I would like to, sometimes I, I like to listen in on the board meetings. Uh, is there a way we can have a, uh, um, uh, like like how we got on Zoom tonight, a sort of like a, uh, you know, a con uh, just a, a click and, and go to it kind of a deal? Sure, sure. I, um, you know, I've, uh, anybody who wants to uh, listen in on the board meetings, uh, send me an email and I'll send them the Zoom link. It's not, uh, it, the, the link changes um, uh, periodically. So just if anybody wants to attend the board meeting, just send me uh, an email and I'll send them the link. Okay, so is your email uh, uh, going to be available to where? Uh, how, how would I get to it if I need to find it? That's it's the question. A, a secretary at LAS.org. It's on the website too. Okay, that's what I need to know because I didn't know how that would work. Yeah, right. Okay, and by the way, the next the next board meeting is on December 9th. And then the next. Uh, so that's oh, that's the, right. That's right. I'm yeah, so, yeah. sorry, Spencer. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the next general meeting? Next general meeting is the 14th. That's where we announce the results of the election. And that's where we have, instead of a guest speaker, that's where we're going to have show and tell. So, uh, again, let me put in a plug. Anybody who wants to do a presentation there, shoot me an email at secretary at las.org, and we'll, we'll work out uh, a schedule for people. And while I have the uh, mic right now, uh, this is the last call to register for door prizes. There are 22 people out of the 34 participants. So only 22 have registered for door prizes. So, and we'll be giving out how many, Alicia? Four today? We're giving out six. Six. Oh, wow. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Quick question, Alicia. Yes. How far advanced uh, notification or request do we need to give for drone usage? That's a good question. Um, preferably, I would say contact us like a week ahead of drone usage time. I think that's yeah. a decent amount of time. Yeah. Um, because we have to write up an authorization and send it back to the board. Right. Um, which yeah. can be done via just, email. Yeah. Thankfully, okay. because we do communicate via email, the board that is, I'm talking about the board. Thankfully, the board communicates via email and not just at board meetings. Yeah. We can approve things via email depending on the subject. So okay. drones would be one of those. Very good. Thank you. I'm going to jump in and ask Chris why he asked that. <laughs> Chris has a, a DJI DJI Phantom Four, uh, 4K drone, so it's it's uh, professional quality, and uh, I'm getting towards my certification for that for a professional okay. level. So it's something that I could offer up to the club. Uh, I'm not. You know, professional yet, but I can go ahead and use it without any problems. So I'm just curious if, if anybody needed that for the club's purposes, it's available. I only asked that because I actually do this for a living, sort of, and I have a bunch of pictures of Lockwood from a drone that I have not offered up yet. Kevin and I talked about it earlier, and because of the change in the bylaws, I've never been willing to put together the article that I was going to present to put into the system because it would appear that a lot of people have an issue with the drones. Um, yeah. I am a photographer for a living. Drone is part of my day-to-day -day equipment. So it's been very weird for me following this uh, drone not allowed Thing. And hence my reason for asking you why you asked that question. Well, as we know, it's it's difficult. There's so many restrictions. I'm over here by the Van Nuys Airport, so technically I can't even lift off in my own backyard. So, I mean, we have to ask for per permission pretty much anywhere we go with this stuff. So that's why I asked. By the way, uh, Chris, just to let you know, um, with the DJI app used properly, I've flown at LAX. Right. And the bottom line is you just have to go through the 
motions of saying, I know what I'm doing and where am I at? And if, it will give you approval with limited height restrictions. Maybe you guys yes. can discuss that after the meeting. Yeah. So, yeah. hey, uh, I, I was wrong when I said that our contact information is on the website. I'd forgotten we'd revised it. So there's a contact us web form on the uh, new LAS website. So if you want to get information about the meeting, uh, just drop a note there or else my email is secretary at las.org. So I'll just post that in the chat as well if anybody wants to attend the next meeting. Okay, thank you, uh, Spencer, and thank you, Alicia, for the update on the uh, Appendix 2 uh, in the bylaws. Do, do appreciate that, the work you did on that. No problem. Now, the most important thing at the time of the meeting, the door prizes. Woo! <laughs> okay, Alicia so. and Spencer, unless there's anything else, we'll go to the door prizes. Alicia and Spencer, it's yours. All right, hey, give me one second. Uh, Alicia, you want to talk about what's, what the door prizes are while I get the, while I harvest the names? Sure. Okay, so for the door prizes today, we have three different categories. Uh, we are giving away two $25 Amazon gift cards. Uh, we are giving away two items from our LAS website store. And we are also giving away two LAS hats because we had excess inventory. So we were like, let's just give them away because why not? They're really cool hats. So hopefully Spencer can get it set okay, up. So yeah, here we go. Them. All right. So I've just, uh, everybody sees a blank spreadsheet there. I'm just going to drop the names in and the first the winner will show up right there for the first one. Okay. So the first thing we're giving away is a $25 Amazon gift card. Oh, Annie. Looks like, yeah. Oh, uh, no, the, right here. So Greg Thompson is the first one. Hey, Greg. Greg. <laughs> Greg, you still there? You Did bet. You That's off? awesome. All right. Oh, you got there. Okay. All right, okay. The next and I, I promise to go. use Amazon Smiles. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Here, here's the next yes. one. Okay. Jose Aguilar. Okay. Jose right. Aguilar just hey. won an item from our LAS website. All right. And it can be any item. There is no limit. The limit is $100, but it's one item. So you're fine. Okay. Okay. Next. Richard Horn. Okay. Yeah, that's me. Richard Horn just won a LAS hat. Nice. Okay. Stan Thompson. Okay. Stan Thompson just won a $25 Amazon gift card. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, let's see words. Okay. Larry Steenhook. Okay, Larry Steenhook just won one item from our LAS website. Is he still online? I don't know. I'm still here. Thank you very okay. much. Okay, there you are, Larry. <laughs> All right, Mr. Lock. One more, or I've lost. Yes, one more. We are giving away an LAS hat. I think Tim needs one of those. Elizabeth Wong. Yeah. <laughs> Elizabeth. Elizabeth. <laughs> okay. Wow. Go for your <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> How do I get it? <laughs> All right. And that ends our door prize giveaway. Thank you to everyone for participating. Okay, that seems to work out pretty good. It looks like the at least it looks like the uh the uh uh, uh Zoom meetings for general meetings are working out pretty good. Hopefully next month we have uh we have a uh, some of our presenters from the club with some of their neat things. Uh, maybe David, you can give us a talk on that uh, on the telescope you got. <laughs> Actually, I wrote an article, and I, uh, I um, uh, who was it? Our secretary said she was going to put it in one of our bulletins, and she never did. And oh, I, Andy, I had, really? yeah, really? I had a lot of the guys. I actually had some of the guys read the article, and they loved it um, because it's uh, it's uh, it's got the pros and the cons of, of it. And uh, so I'd love to get it published with you guys. So, 
It didn't Sky and Telescope just cover that product in like a six page article? Well, mine's completely different. Mine's a whole to different take on it. It's from a, from an amateur standpoint and, and from a, what a professional would use versus, I mean, what you guys do, like at our, for, specifically with our group compared to what this thing does and, and the, the pros, like I say, pros and cons. And, uh, and uh, I, just bought the, I just bought the new one, another new uh, digital scope, and Annie got one too. And, and Phil, yeah. we just got the new uh, Vespera by Stellina, by, uh, by Onus. It sounds like a show and tell to me, David. Let's. Uh, yeah, you know, that's not like a show and tell, yeah. David. Yeah. Okay, you got a deal, guys. So, um, <laughs> you know, it's right, well, resubmit to Andy. So, so, are are David and Andy bringing their scopes up to Lockwood next week? Uh, no, because the uh, the the new the new one we're getting from Vionis, which is which built Stellina. Uh, they will not be out until next year. They just had a Kickstarter program that was very successful, and um, they raised two million dollars on it, like within within a couple weeks. So, so um, but but you already have one, right? Well, I, no, I don't have. I just purchased this. I, well, I, the one I have now is what Phil has, and one other member of our group, which is the uh, the uh, the Unistellar right. digital scope. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Matter of fact, the picture are, I have are, behind are, me are, are that's from my that's from my telescope. Bring that up to Lockwood this week so that yes oh yeah it'll be there oh, yeah we're coming them. yes definitely bringing cool. it yes are you coming up to work or are you just coming up with no snow? I'm coming up to work as well I'm yeah I'm going to be there I'll, I already put in my time I should get there uh, I'm going to get there a little late because I'm doing the stakes with the um the the, uh, the tape I already bought the stakes and the glow tape I already have it in my David, car David uh, David I'm just picking on you I'm the one bringing up the sledgehammer to knock your stakes down into the ground just don't miss <laughs> Does everybody okay, agree well, with pizzas again for uh, work parties lunch? I know. I'll bring that. Can I bring jump in for a second and ask a question? We in the past, every time we have the the Monday meeting, there's normally been a Wednesday Lockwood meeting after, and I don't have any knowledge of that oh, yet. It's um, no, actually. Uh, no, uh, we, we, we schedule those uh, usually uh, um, prior to uh, a, uh, a work party day, at least we try to, so we can discuss, uh, discuss the items and needed uh, to doing. And uh, uh, so our, our previous uh, uh, committee meeting is covering uh what we're doing this weekend okay so we're not having so a we're sure. no it's 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 not a uh, it's not a monthly it, uh, especially kind of like right now we're going into winter and uh it uh, the weather is just not gonna uh, uh going to be there for us to 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 work through uh uh the muddy conditions that we get up there <clears throat> so Okay. Things will things will improve. Uh, Hopefully, the stakes are going a lot easier with the yeah, yeah. The, from the snow from last week. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, good. Well, we'll see I, you all I'm there. So new to this, I just wanted to ensure how the yeah how it works with the meetings. I know we have this is the monthly, but we've all, we've had our Lockwood meetings separate a few days later, and Correct. I wasn't sure if that was a norm. No, oh. it's not. Uh, oh. No, it's not a norm. Okay, cool. Actually, okay, when we were, yeah, when we were doing them at Garvey, we we tried to do them on a on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah well, everything everything is kind of in in limbo right now when things are happening, but but still, at least at least things are getting done. I'm really uh, grateful. The club is grateful for everybody that's doing all the effort at Lockwood Valley and the improvements at Lockwood Valley, and thank you for all of that. I did see the pictures from John mm -hmm. O'Brien with a new restroom it looks spectacular it looks everything looks good out there at lockwood valley so uh hats off to all of you guys at uh, lockwood valley on uh on taking care of that for us this year okay i think we've covered everything at the meeting we needed to cover and i think uh does anybody have any objections to adjourning the meeting hey, hey spencer yeah. you, i think you need to tell the winners of the club merchandise, how to collect their prize. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> oh, sounds good. Alicia, you wanna take that one? It, they just sent it to my address. 
No, <laughs> what happens is um, I'm going to get the emails from Spencer and I'm going to send out emails this week to everybody who won. And for the people who get the Amazon gift cards, I'm going to be sending an email confirming that that email is where they want the $25 gift card sent to. And then for the uh, website items, um, I'm going to direct um, each of the winners to the LAS website store and they get to pick one item and then tell me what it is um, back in an email and I will order it and it'll take about a week for it to ship out, actually, to like actually ship out and then it'll get there in about a week or so. So like it's like a two week process for items getting shipped from the store, I think somewhere around there. Um, and then for the hats, I'm going to see C. Joe Phipps in the emails when I contact the winners because Joe is going to be the one sending the hats to the winners, right, Joe? Yeah. 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 So the person who's responding to the email will send their address so that we know where we're sending the hats to. So unlike last month, pay attention to your email, to the email address that you used to register tonight. Yes, please make sure the email you um, <laughs> signed in with is the correct email. I, I have a, a weird question. You, sure. Uh, you, you don't have your video turned on. No. But every time somebody talks to you, they're using a name that is different than what I see in the little box. The box That's my mom's that name. <laughs> Okay, so that's that's, I, I was confused because it keeps saying Stephanie Hurst in the box, but you're not Stephanie. No, that's my mom. My mom was <laughs> here too. My uh, mom. I'm just saying, new guy <laughs> looking at that. I'm confused. <laughs> Sorry about the confusion. Yeah, my mom wanted to see the presentation too. Okay, um, you need you need to fix that. <laughs> there's a well, bunch of old guys. There's a bunch of old guys here that don't, you know, can't deal with that kind of stuff. Uh, before mm -hmm. we adjourn, I do have a question for Tim and about yeah. uh, Mount Wilson. Uh, Tim, is there any um, uh, ideas about how they could do social distancing uh, by at, uh, still and, and still opening up the telescope or, or that area at all? Or um, that's really hard to do because we're not the custodians of the land. Okay. We have to follow Forest Service regulations, county regulations, oh, okay. museum regulations, <laughs> and, and it's really Nothing's hard to do. Yeah. Okay. We've talked about that. The board's going to meet again, uh, I think, next week, late, later this month. The uh, Institute okay. Board will meet. But now, of course, with the fire, we've got to go up there and inspect the property, and we haven't had a chance to do that yet. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other items? Uh, yeah, I'm going to jump in and interrupt for a second. Tim, you mentioned the yeah. fires. I assumed we were past that. And you mentioned the way you said it, you needed to like uh, investigate. Are there issues that we don't know about up there? Um, no, but um, we know that we did not lose any structures. Uh, we know that there was no serious damage to anything, uh, but the the relay antenna that that handles the Wi-Fi for Garvey that comes from Mount Wilson almost certainly melted in the fire. But I have to go there and see. Um, what I mean is that the Board of Trustees and uh, Facilities Committee, and, and I'm one of them, we have to go up there and talk to the superintendent of the observatory and find out um, what went right, what went wrong. The firefighters were really happy that we have 700,000 gallons of firefighting water for them, and they use about half of it. <clears throat> but they made some suggestions about how we can improve the fire suppression system. So we need to talk to the supervisor but what did he learn from the fire department so that we can improve on the system that we already have? <clears throat> and that's what I was referring to. <clears throat> but the fires themselves, no, they're, even if the snow falls, the fires don't go out. There's still fires smoldering inside burned out tree trunks 
and under the ground because the, the fire will be six inches under the ground to where the mulch is and it just keeps smoldering. And sometimes fires like that can smolder for a year. You, you have to really keep an eye on it. Okay, well, thank you, Tim. If you could update us when you get that, uh, get that information from the uh, Mount Wilson board, it's always good information to have for yeah. us too. Appreciate that, Tim. Yeah. Okay, now I'm what, one last again. thing. Any, one last thing else? before we knock we knock off, is there anything that we as a club can do to help Josie? Is she still on? Well, yeah, I'm yeah, here. <laughs> there. Is um, there. What do you need? We can do as an organization to help you further your goals. Thank you so much. That was that's really kind of you. Um, I'm I'm not sure. Um, I mean, honestly, we put you on the spot. So yeah. <laughs> if you think of something, Oops. you know where to find us. You can put you can put us on your resume that that you used us for a uh, for uh, one of your uh, your lectures. <laughs> Thank <sure>. you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, and this is partially a fault of my own that I haven't. Um, I haven't been able to like engage as much with the community, even though I literally was a member already. Um, just given my my schedule with all my classes and soccer practice and everything. But um, I mean, I don't know. I just, I love meeting other people with my same interests because no one else in my household thinks any of this is interesting. So <laughs> yeah, yeah I mean, that's just the most torture. It's maybe nice to board. be able to chat with people who also share the same. Maybe interest. the board or Curtis can come up with some with an idea. Yeah, hello. yeah well, I I think I, I she's uh, Josie's probably is if she's a member, she's probably a student member, and uh, we'll we have to discuss that on the board. But she does have uh, uh, the fact that she gave a talk. She has a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, uh, we may give her a membership for a year or something. I don't know what we're going to do yet. We'll figure something out for her. Because we've already she, she definitely we've, deserves it. We've already done. Well, we've already talked you've to already done that, Spencer. Yeah, yeah we, we, she and I. Breaker, talked breaker. About it. Yeah, Jack <laughs> here. Uh, I would like to mention yeah. to Josie that the Denver Astronomical Society maintains the Van Natten Hansen Scholarship Fund. And oh, wow. it would cer certainly be worth it to apply to, uh, to a denverastro.org, is our website. And uh, uh, if you root around in there, you should be able to find Van Atten Hansen Scholarship Fund. And I'd strongly recommend you put it in an application. All right. Can you please repeat the name of it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Denver Astronomical Society is at denverastro.org. Okay. And uh, poke around in our website, Van Natten Hansen Scholarship Fund. I will. Uh, I don't know. You've got an email address. You're you're uh, on the list for uh, LAAS. Yeah, I can also I can just put it in the chat, um, so you don't have to go digging through the list. You can always send anything to me too, Jack, and I'll see that she gets it. Yeah, and by the way, Tim, uh, my financial advisor and and Hilltop <laughs> Securities are wanting to pull your beard. So <laughs> where the hell happened to those? <laughs> well, like I said, I've got to I've got to look in my junk mail piles and see if I can find it because you yeah. know they send it too stealthy. Well, they, they do. Have had a big she admitted that they make it look like junk mail, and heaven knows. Yeah, they made it look too much like junk mail. Yeah, it's fortunately only I don't throw that. It's away. Important. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, guys, the fact that we can actually maybe help. Josie get where she wants to go is brilliant. There's a lot of us here that have some level of connection somewhere. I'm not one of them, but most of you are. Tim is the go-to guy, man, I'm sure. I yeah, well, well, well we she got... knows more important people than even I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least at least one good thing about our club, we do have a diverse uh, uh, selection of members in our club. Uh, Tim Thompson, we know he's got a lot of connections and 
And Jack Eastman, he's probably, I think, Jack, I think you've been a member longer than Tim Thompson has, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I joined 52. Wait, did you, Look, is, Jack, Jack. Is, Jack, is Jack still alive? <laughs> yeah. Jack, <laughs> last Jack time I bought <laughs> Alvin Clark from Alvin Clark. He didn't get it <laughs> second hand. <laughs> he got it first hand. <laughs> Okay, well, looks like uh, are we to a point where we can adjourn the meeting now? Any other comments or questions? A real quick, quick one. Is Mike Gardner still online? Yeah, I'm still awake. How you doing? Uh, okay, I'm, I'm fine. And I just wanted to make sure you're fine. And uh, we have to do something about Ed Edwards. Yeah, like, I know. Don't get know a blowtorch after him to, yeah. or buy him a new reply key. Right. Yeah, I don't I want to don't want to set anybody aside here or, or make any comments, but Jack and I have known each other for over 66 years now. Oh, we met in high school. Back in the days when you had to carry stone tablets around for your books. <laughs> well, I, I've known Jack. I've known Jack for about about 30 years. Yeah. Yeah. Well, he's uh, uh there's no other Jack around. That's for darn sure. <laughs> Yeah, that's why my parents said one of me was enough. Yeah, right. <laughs> when I was in high school, they still taught cuneiform. <laughs> <laughs> I've still got the sticks to prove it, yeah. Yeah, and those darn tablets were heavy. Woof. They were, right, I know. I used to be eight foot three, and now I'm two foot two. <laughs> well, at least, at, least back, at least back in those times, we were able to handle it. Now, I don't think we can handle it because of our age. <laughs> oh, God, no. No. Okay, well, I think it's uh, time to adjourn. What do you think, guys? I second it. Okay, okay yeah. let's go ahead and adjourn the meeting. This uh, uh, the LES uh, monthly uh, November general membership meeting has been officially adjourned. Okay, I'm oh, gonna boy. stop. I'm gonna stop the live stream, but you guys are free. To